This is pretty cool. Let me show you guys what I'm working on. This is my Ender 3 Pro. That is obviously not the stock control screen, but we're just gonna resume this print here. And as that starts resuming, we'll go take a look at it from the side and uh, watch the extruder over there. This is just a dummy print. I'm just printing in the air, and you can see that I'm about to run out of filament here. And as that runs out of filament, we will watch it happen uh, there and also on the tablet here, which is linked into uh, the Duet Maestro board on the printer through the web interface here. There's my layer times. You can see just the graph, just great little interface as we wait for this thing to pop the air. All right, so extruder zero reports no filament. Yeah, we knew that. Um, what we can do now is click the retract button right there. And it should spit out that tail right here so that we can get a hang of it. And just pull that remnant bit of filament out, toss that, and we're ready to reload uh, the new filament and continue our print. Here in the CAD environment, which is a uh, Rhinoceros 3D, that's my 3D drawing program of choice, we can see the uh, original stock extruder coming from Creality, and I drew this up just to get uh, base geometry, uh, you know, to start my, my modifications with. And this, I think, is version number three or so. I am... Um, there's a lot of iterations that I go through, right? Design, prototype, test. These are the some of the digital uh, iterations, and there's also these physical prints, the physical iterations, because you can't always see everything here in the digital environment. You can't predict everything. Uh, you can't know everything that you want to, uh, to change. You have to test it with your hands. So um, as I go along, though, I tend to just sort of you know, modify this geometry without saving it. Sometimes I remember to copy a new version over and start modifying the new version, but oftentimes I just start drawing right over the old version. So I don't maintain a complete log of all of my changes, but who needs who needs that? So this right here is the final, final uh, version. And there's just some very small tweaks made to this, small adjustments from what you guys saw in action just now on the printer. Um, so we're gonna print this up and I'll show you guys how to assemble it because it is uh, kind of involved and you do have to get it just right because it is a mechanical assembly. Um, but we're going to need a couple of bits of hardware. Mostly this uses the, uh, the bolts and the spring and all the hardware from the stock extruder. But we need magnets and a switch and some Bowden tube. Uh, so let's go look at eBay and I'll show you those. This is the switch we're gonna need. It looks just like this. It goes under the name of optical end stop limit switch for 3D printers or ramps or, you know, just do a search for those keywords and you'll find it. Look, this one here costs a dollar with free shipping, of course. Um, you'll need two of these little neodymium magnets and they are five millimeter in diameter, that's on the cylinder, and then two millimeters tall. Uh, so 10 of them also costs a dollar and then you will need some Bowden tube and this Bowden tube is four millimeters on the outer diameter and two millimeters on the inner diameter. Now I've gotten four millimeter nominal OD stuff that was actually 3.8 millimeters. Typically I find it to be 4.2 millimeters though. So um, I've made versions of the geometry and actually I've, I've provided the print files as well for printing on the Ender 3. Um, that uh, that use both the 3.8 millimeter or the four millimeter tubing. So you'll need to put a caliper on your tubing and figure out just how big your OD is. You don't really know what you're gonna get. It's kind of a crapshoot coming from China. But hey, at a dollar, who can complain? So yeah, you're looking at $3 in um, components, plus what, like 50 cents worth of, uh, worth of filament here. So all in all, it's like an under $5 project. Uh, to get this fantastic functionality added to your printer. All right, well, let's peel this print up off the bed and start assembling, shall we? Let's see if we can take this off. Ah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the print's fine, obviously. Uh, so let's just get this taken apart and uh, maybe clean it up a little bit and then start assembling. It should be pretty obvious, having looked at the, um, at the CAD uh, program, how this assembles. Basically, the little arm here goes inside the bigger arm 
and then the bigger arm mounts like that. Now we're mostly gonna use the hardware from the stock extruder. We're gonna use almost all of this, the spring and the bolts and the, uh, well, we'll use almost all that. But we're gonna need a couple of bits of extra hardware, and that's this pile right here. I'll flash what those are on the screen. And then um, you might not wanna print this the way that I did it. Um, you might wanna print up each of the parts individually just so that they are cleaner. Uh, you tend to get sort of like oozing artifacts when you print multiple objects at one time. Um, but you certainly, at any rate, definitely wanna print the, uh, the bushing. You wanna print that separate because you really want that to be round and uh, there are problems. There's always problems printing round things, multiple versions of it. So now that that's perfectly round, it will slide right in there and that will work just the way that we want it to. Um, so yeah, like I said, pretty obvious how this whole thing goes together. Um, but what I wanna do here is uh, give you a couple of hints to, uh, to just help you get a successful build. Um, these holes, so we're gonna start with this one right here. Uh, this hole in the small arm, that's the big hole, and this hole right here on the back side of the main arm, those are press fits. So those are sized just ever so slightly undersized so that this uh, Bowden tube or PTFE tube will just barely press into those, like if you have to press really hard. Um, and so as such, you might have a problem um, getting that to press in there. Um, there's a couple of techniques. The first one is to take your knife and what you wanna do is just sort of like cut a little chamfer all the way around uh, the edge of your boat or the tip of your Bowden tube. But you don't wanna cut into the inner diameter. You're just sort of chamfering that edge a little bit just to help guide it into uh, the hole. I'm doing this build here with the 4.2 millimeter uh, PTFE tube, um, but if you get the 3.8 millimeter, you'll need to use the other print, obviously. Okay, so now that that's done, what you can do is cut it off square and then use some sort of pliers to press it in. Now I have these Nipex or Kinipex, however you want to say it. Uh, these are wonderful, it's a wonderful tool. And so because of the parallel motion of these jaws, I find it really helpful to just sort of uh, squeeze that Bowden tube into place. But the other reason that you're going to need to put a sharpened tip on these uh, on this Bowden tube is to get it threaded into the nuts. I'm going to um, use this, I think it's a 15 16 inch uh, bit, and that measures just over 4.2 millimeters. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, I don't know what you're going to do if you live somewhere where you can't get access to SAE sized bits, because that's pretty much perfect. And I'm just cleaning up that hole uh, in the back of this print, and that's obviously, uh, well, you can tell which hole that is. And the other hole you wanna clean up like this is the front hole here on the main arm. So just get that in there. And you don't wanna go all the way through, you just wanna get that front edge. Now what you can do is take your sharpened uh, tip here, and we're gonna drop the nut into the little slot boom, and then we're gonna take that sharpened tip and push it in there and start trying to thread it into the nut. So this hole functions to nicely um, align the Bowden tube so you can get it in there. But the Bowden tube is really slippery, and so in order to get a grip on it, you might need to use a piece of sandpaper and just sort of push really hard, and it'll catch, and it'll start threading in. And I can feel it threading in. And, and this hole you can thread all the way until it, um, until it stops, until there's kind of a lot of resistance because it's gonna be bottoming out in the hole. But what you can also do here, and this helps you get the, um, get the pressed fitting into the other holes here, um, is use that threaded portion, which is now sort of squeezed down and condensed, and you'll use that to get this, to sort of pre-align uh, pre it, to get this pressed into these press fit holes. So that will press in, and then where it hasn't been threaded, it's a hard fit, so at this point, I like to kind of give myself that width of that part plus a little bit more and do your best to get that cut just really square. Uh, that's just gonna help you press it in. Now there are little tools that you can download off of Thingiverse that help you get perfectly square cuts on your Bowden tube. So I don't know, maybe that's a prudent idea, but I'm able to get it to work like this. 
Okay, so like I said, you just put that in there on the threaded portion to start. Use the, uh, the fancy pliers to get it all the way in there. Um, and there it is. So uh, you can see here on the close-up cam, you can see how it's mushrooming on. You see that? And that means that that Bowden tube is done. It is pressed um, all the way through though, and that's what we need. So now we can take our knife and just cut it off flush. So there we have it. That's a nice uh, press fit. It's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, so when the filament's feeding through it, we're not gonna lose it or something like that. So I'm gonna do the same technique to this hole here and then we'll move on. So I already have this little tail uh, pre-made and that's just gonna thread into this portion here and it threads all the way through until I can see it sort of bottoming out on the inside there. Okay, the next thing we wanna do is use this 5 16 inch drill bit and that comes out to be almost exactly two millimeters. So again, if you're not in America, I don't know, find a two millimeter sized drill bit and just drill that through the holes here to clean them out because they're press fit and we wanna make sure that that does, uh, that the filament will go through that sort of resized hole. You also need to do that with the, with the plastic part, with the, with the ABS print. You just need to clean out that, that filament guide right there. So you definitely wanna come from the backside on that. So now uh, I got a little bit of ugliness on my print here. Um, I don't know why that happened. You might wanna print these parts separately to avoid situations like this but I'm pretty sure that this will still work. But one thing that's prudent to do on almost any uh, filament that you use is to color this tang with a Sharpie as best as you can. And the reason is that the, uh, the, 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 the filament itself might be translucent, more or less translucent, but also um, the, the, the laser beam can just sort of bounce around, uh, be reflected off of this filament. So by you know, dulling the sheen on the filament, uh, you are reducing the chances of that happening. Um, and you'll also wanna probably do it to the, um, the inside of this part right here, just, just all up inside there as best as you can. Just, uh, you know, just help things along. Okay, now we have these magnets and we wanna get them installed and they're easy enough to do. Uh, again, I'm just going to use my Nipex pliers. Uh, you can use some, I don't know, vice grip type deals or I don't know. But I just put those on there and the first magnet doesn't matter. You just put it in any old which way and just get it lined up and then give it a little bit of a squeeze and it presses right into that hole and it's a nice friction fit. So now what you want to do is just get the other magnet to stick to it, which it's doing. And then I like to mark the top of that magnet. So the marked portion here uh, with the Sharpie on it is what we want to see when we put that into the hole. So I'm going to pull that off, throw that into there and see it's upside down. So I'm going to use my drill bit here and I can now see the Sharpie. So let's, uh, there we go. So that's the downside and then press that in just like so. And it goes nicely down to the bottom of the hole uh, so that we get a good uh, magnetic spring on that. So now we need to install the little lever arm here into the main arm, and we're gonna do that uh, using just a little remnant of filament, this, this bit right here. But first we need to drill out that hole uh, so that it is two millimeters, and that gives us a little bit of play uh, on, the, on the filament. So this filament can just slide through here and pivot freely. Um, but we don't want to do, we do not wanna drill those holes out. Um, because those should be a nice tight fit out of the print. Um, but in order to get this through, we're gonna need to sharpen this filament by just cutting a tip into it, a nice sharp tip, okay? And then I like to use a pair of pliers just to get it in there. Um, it, is, it is tight. There we go, there's the first hole, and then there it is, all the way through. So use those same flush cutters and just cut that like so, and now we have a nice magnetic mechanism. And that's pretty much it. Um, we are ready to install the main hardware from, the, uh, from the, the extruder that came from Creality. Now, one thing to note um, with the Creality extruder is they have this spring located pretty much as far as they can get it. Uh, you know, it's right there still over the extruder motor. So 
Uh, I don't know that they gave that much thought about spring pressure, and to me it seemed like uh, I could do with more spring pressure. So I have two mounting places for the spring. This is the stock location, and then this gives us a little bit more force. So I'm going to use the, uh, the more force location. So taking off this um, pulley wheel now, uh, we're just going to use the correct size Allen wrench. And we will not use this little nut, uh, I'm sorry, that bolt. This is where we're going to need that 10 millimeter long, uh, 4 millimeter Allen bolt. And we're just going to thread that straight into the plastic here. So you just press a little bit hard to get it started. You just, you'll feel those threads bite with a little bit of mashing. And then once they do, you can just thread it on home. And don't strip it out, you know, it's just plastic you're threading into, but you, you thread it down until it feels nice and tight. Uh, and then I'm actually rubbing the, uh, the pulley. Here you can see it, the pulley is rubbing the, uh, that little bit of extra uh, filament that I had sticking out. So let me trim that down. All right, that spins nice and free now. So we are in business and ready to install this uh, back onto the printer, just like so. It's a lot easier to install the sensor at this point before the uh, extruder is mounted on the printer uh, and that just uses those two three millimeter bolts and also the uh, the bushing threads uh, onto the uh, actual the stock bolt there and that just presses into there and should be a nice uh, tight fit and give you good um, Get you, get you good movement without actually um, causing too much play. Okay, a quick addendum. Uh, I did one final improvement to the design, and that is this little bump that you can see here on the top of the arm. And that just functions to more captively hold the filament on the retract movement when you're retracting to, uh, to reload it once it's run out of filament. But we have one little uh, thing that we need to do because of this modification. And uh, you can see right there in the crack with my fingernail there, that the filament is bottoming out on the PTFE tube. And so what we need to do is make that into a cone or kind of like a funnel. So a really good way to do that is to use a countersink tool such as this one and to just sort of spin it in there by hand um, until that is conical. But you can also use a rusty, uh, a rusty razor blade like this one and accomplish the same task. And in fact, I think the razor blade kind of works better and now we can see that this nice blunt end on the uh, filament will in fact feed right through. So we won't have a problem with it retracting once it's run out of filament. Red light, no light. Red light, no light. Red light, no light. Awesome. We now have filament detection. Okay, but it's not perfect, right? So this was a problem that I recently had. You can see this 90 degree bend in the, uh, in the filament and this was the last of a roll and this is where it loaded into the roll. And as that fed into my extruder, uh, it got caught at the 90 degree bend and it just started grinding at the hob gear because this jammed it up. So this uh, detector would not work in a situation like this. So what you need to do to remedy the situation here is to go into the center of the spool, there's that big hole, and you should be able to find the tail end of your filament and just clip it square, clip, it, clip that 90 degree bend off of it, and then this will work just fine. Um, there is also the condition where you get a jam up there in your hot end, and so it's just grinding here also. So uh, this would not detect that either. So there's two sort of moments uh, that, that this $5 solution will not handle, but those are usually pretty extreme edge cases. Uh, so this is a great little solution for the money. Speaking of which, let me tell you about the other features that make this extruder such an upgrade over the stock version. Um, first of all, the sharp point here, right there where it goes between the, uh, the pulley and the hob gear, you can see it's just really sharp. So that means that there's almost no opportunity for a flexible filament to sort of pop out the top. I've, I've had that condition where it just sort of looped and so it wasn't feeding down into the extruder, it was just sort of building this loop up out here. Um, but that's not gonna happen with this design. With the stock design, you can see that it's just a lot more blunted so that there's, there's more of a gap there and it's, it's possible for that filament to pop out. Um, speaking of the stock extruder, look at this. This is the fitting, right, that, that, the, that the Bowden tube attaches with. Watch that gap as we are retracting and then extruding and retracting and extruding, retracting and extruding. So you can see that gap is, 
it's changing. And that can lead to problems, it's not good. So a better solution is the nuts, where they just do not move. There is no movement between the Bowden tube and the extruder, so that's nice. Um, I also relocated that spring, as I talked to you guys about earlier, which gives you more leverage uh, pinching the filament up here. Uh, you can still put it in the stock location if you trust the, uh, the way that the engineers at Creality came up with that. But if you want to pinch a little bit harder, you have that option. Um, the front here uh, also has a Bowden tube popping out of it. So that means that you can run this Bowden tube all the way to a dry box if, uh, if that's what you're doing. Like you're printing a nylon and you want to keep your filament out of the elements all the way until it reaches the hot end pretty much. Um, but even just this little tail of Bowden tube uh, keeps the filament off of the lead screw here. And there's oil on the lead screw so that means that your filament's not getting oily. Which is, you know, a minor issue but it's a nice little thing to have, a little option to have there. And I think the final upgrade that I added is this little tang under here to mount a zip tie to. So I don't know if you guys can see that zip tie, but uh, it's holding the, uh, the wiring there. I don't know what they were thinking uh, with the stock extruder with this, you know, ineffective bit of geometry to try to hold that wiring, but uh, this is a much better solution than that. So yeah, all in all, I think it's a great upgrade for $5. And uh, now we just need to talk about wiring it. If you do not have a, um, a duet board installed on your printer, it is possible to get this to work with the stock control board. There is a pin right there. You can see it says S for signal, uh, which you can tap into. I don't know where you would get power and ground, but there's lots of locations to tap into that, I'm sure. Also, it's possible to clip the speaker from the uh, screen and use that uh, pin as well. But then, of course, you will have to modify the, uh, the Marlin firmware that came with this board uh, to get it to work. But it's possible to do it, I think. I think you can get this uh, filament run out and also uh, bed leveling, a bed leveling sensor, both to work on this board. But that's about the limits uh, of the stock board. And uh, anybody who's watched this channel for any length of time knows my extremely low opinion of this control board. So you're better off replacing this either with an upgraded uh, Ramps 1.4 based board running Marlin, but actually you're best off running a duet board like I do. And so that's what we're gonna cover now is how to wire this into your duet board and the one single line macro change that you need to do in order for the firmware to read it. Okay, so this is a picture of the Duet Maestro and it's pretty much the same on the Duet Wi-Fi and Duet um, Ethernet. So these three pin connectors here that you see in a row, uh, these are your end stop switches. So that is Z, Y, and X, I believe. And then you have these two uh, extra filament run out or whatever you want to use them for, but those are limit switches basically. And on your filament run out uh, switch, on the optical switch, it's labeled S, V, and G. V stands for voltage or it's five voltage, basically, five volts uh, DC. And so yeah, signal, ground, and voltage wire into those three uh, pins, just like that. Over here on the interface into your um, duet board, you go into settings, system editor, config.g, and scroll down to the bottom, and under custom settings, I mean you could add it anywhere, but I like to put it under custom settings, it's M591 space D0 space C3 space P1 space E1 space S1. And that will uh, that will turn on the functionality for the filament runout switch. So it's just that easy. And save the changes, reboot the board, and you are ready to go. I need to give credit to uh, three sources of my ideas for this uh, extruder design. The first is Lazaro Film, and that is a Thingiverse user, and it was his thing that uh, gave me the idea for this scissoring action uh, to detect whether or not the filament has gone through the, uh, the arm, the sensor activating arm. Um, so I'll link to that thing in the description of this video. The second uh, source of in inspiration for this design was um, Schematics, and that is a uh, YouTube channel, and there's a fantastic tutorial that he did where he taught me how to do the captive nut holding the um, Bowden tube. So what a fantastic technique that is. Um, and yeah, without that video, I would not have learned how to do that. I don't know if he invented the idea or if he's also, you know, using it, saw it somewhere else and he's using it, but it's a, it's a great technique. So thank you to Schematics. And the third uh, 
person to give credit to or group to give credit to is Prusa for the uh, magnetic spring flipping that arm up. Um, so yeah, whether or not it's Joseph Prusa himself or another engineer there at Prusa who is nameless and he shouldn't be nameless, I'd love to give him credit, um, or her if it's a her. Uh, yeah, but at any rate, that Prusa design is where I got that idea and it's working out quite well for me. So thank you to those sources for uh, inspiring me and um, helping to make this a success. Let's talk about this for a second. So um, those three ideas, which I've implemented into this uh, extruder design here, um, they are, they're just out there, right? They're not patented. There's really nothing except sort of a, a moral issue about copying, right? There's nothing preventing those ideas from being copied, which is why China gets away with copying everything all the time. Um, but let's pretend for a second that they were patented, all three of them. So even if each of those items was patented, I could still get a patent on my overall design here that incorporates all three of them. And it's useful to note that because using the, um, the patent system as our mental matrix for understanding intellectual property, we can see that um, acknowledging sources, giving credit to the, uh, the genesis of ideas, the, the, the place where the ideas came from, does not diminish my achievement in the slightest. So that's the lesson to be learned there. All right, I wanna give a big acknowledgement to these fine folks. These are the guys who support this channel monetarily. And um, without them, you wouldn't have a video to watch. So please give a thank you to them in the, uh, in the comments down below uh, or join their ranks over there on Patreon. And if you want to get your hands on this geometry, that is how you do it. Um, for those of you who are currently Patreon supporters, go ahead and follow the link which you have already been given to that folder, you will find uh, this geometry there, ready for you to print up and add this functionality to your printer. And that'll do it for this video. Thanks for watching, see you next time.